gold trails and ghost towns. Share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts, Bill Barley, our storyteller and researcher and knower of stuff. Today we're talking about gold as it accrued to some people from the mining of coal. We're heading to Vancouver Island, the hub city, Nanaimo. Once called the coal city, Mike, and I think with good reason. When you look at Nanaimo, and it has a you know, vast history, it goes right back into the 1850s. So this is an old, old city, still a, still a significant city in, in British Columbia. Two individuals you really have to concentrate on when you talk about Nanaimo. One came from Victoria, James Douglas. He was chief factor in Victoria in 1843. Factor of the Hudson's Bay Company. That's right. Okay. And the other was at that time little known. In the 1850s, a guy called Robert Dunsmuir came over to mine coal. In, in the Fort Rupert area, and uh, came from Ayrshire, a Scottish miner, coal miner, and eventually became one of the most powerful men in British Columbia, and certainly the richest. The richest man in British Columbia. No doubt about it. Okay, take a break. We'll be back in just a second to find out how all of this transpires just after these words. The power to play more. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts, Bill Barley, talking about Nanaimo today. So what happened uh, that uh, suddenly made Nanaimo want to come to prominence? Okay, there was only one major town, as I said before. That was Fort Victoria. But in, 1800 and, in the 1840s, the early 1840s, the British Navy converts from sail to steam. If they convert from sail to steam, they need coal. And they need it fairly close by major British uh, port in Esquimalt. The British Navy used it all the time. They had to find coal. And who's alert to this? Well, of course, the chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company, James Douglas, is the guy. So they, but they make a mistake. The Hudson's Bay Company were not noted miners. They knew the Indians... They knew furs, but they didn't know mines, right? They knew furs very okay. well. And they, they knew that the Indians in the, in, in the so-called Fort Rupert area now uh, were mining coal on, on the surface near the, near the harbor. So they sent in a batch of miners from Scotland to mine the coal. They never found any continuous seam of coal. They stayed up there and they fooled around with it and they really never made a, made a go of it. But at almost the same time, in 1849, an Indian called Chiwichitkan came down into Victoria to fix his gun, his musket. And the Hudson's Bay Company employee then showed him a lump of coal and said, if you know where some of this is, we want to see it. Oh, he says, get lots of it in my area. He came from Nanaimo. And the employee said, we will give you a good bottle of Hudson's Bay rum, and we'll fix your gun forever. So the guy thought, well, that's interesting. He went back to Nanaimo. Don't see him for months. Finally, in the spring of next year, he comes back with a boatload of very fine coal. A canoe load. Yeah. A he, canoe his load His own of canoe. Coal. He comes all the way down from... Nanaimo. All the way down from Nanaimo, paddling this canoe, it's like an, full it's of like coal. like 80 miles he moves sure. down the coast with a boatload of, of yep. coal. All by himself. So the Hudson's Bay Company now has the, the clue they need. Yes, but they still, don't, they still think Fort Rupert yeah. is going to go. Fort Rupert doesn't go. And finally, in the early 1850s, they say, we've got to make an arrangement. So Douglas then moves in and makes some, some arrangements with the Indians of the area. He signs a number of treaties to protect this area for the Hudson's Bay Company, which essentially is the owner of Vancouver Island. The Indians don't think so, but the Hudson's Bay Company does. And um, so th they move in on this, they get the treaty signed, and by 1853-54, they start mining coal in there. And they're doing quite well. The coal comes right out to the harbor in many instances, a number of significant seams, sometimes two or three feet in width, sometimes six or seven feet. And then they're afraid of, not the local Indians, they're afraid of the Kwakiutl and they're afraid of the Haidas and they're afraid of the northern Indians who have a history of uh, depredations against the southern Indians. So they decide to build a bastion in that area. And the bastion's there to this day. Yeah. Now this shot is uh, off a postcard and yeah. it shows the bastion in one of its earliest stages sure. and in the background the ships of sure. the time. Oh yeah. 
So and that would be right around that time, would it? Yeah, that would be probably a little bit later, but the bastion was built in 1854. Right. And never really used, but it's still there, which is amazing. It's a good-looking building, isn't it? It gave the gun ports for the people. Was it ever used in a defensive purpose, or did its existence frighten off attackers? No, the quack Udle came in one day, and everybody hid in the bastion, so it wasn't used to frighten off the quack Udle, but there were cannon up there. And the bastion is the oldest Hudson's Bay bastion in Canada. What a wonderful piece yeah, of history. What really, a smart of the really, Nanaimoites to actually save it. Sure, really quite marvelous. Okay. Well, yeah. did everybody from Fort Rupert then decide to come down to Nanaimo? Okay, what they did, Mike, is they brought the miners down from Fort Rupert. And rather interesting, because there are a bunch of miners, all knew their work, but there's one individual there who's extremely shrewd. Name is Robert Dunsmuir. And Robert Dunsmuir came from Ayrshire, Scottish miner, uh, good miner, very, very shrewd businessman, as we'll later find out. And... The Hudson's Bay Company starts the coal mining business on Vancouver Island, but they are not very good at it. But nevertheless, there's so much coal there around Nanaimo and just north of Nanaimo and just northwest of Nanaimo that really even the Hudson's Bay Company can make a go of it. And they start to mine the coal, and by the 1860s, it's got a good name because the Americans are looking at it, the British Navy insists upon it, and so Nanaimo starts to develop into a real coal town. Now, Dunsmuir must have uh, thought himself quite the uh, giant killer to be able to go head-to-head -head with the Hudson's Bay Company, but he had a, an edge on them. He actually knew what he was doing. Oh, sure he did. Sure he did. He was studying all the time. And uh, what happened, of course, by 1860s, the Indians are now mining coal in the area, and they get paid so much per day, usually in trade goods. So they're trading for beads and shirts and, and various other things and, and, and iron tools and mm -hmm. everything that they want, Mike. And there are also... There are also some Chinese they're starting to bring into the area. So that's rather interesting. Now, this particular photograph actually shows that. Uh, there's the mine. Th there's not a lot of uh, sort of infrastructure around. The trees have been knocked down, and the, yeah. and the shafts come right out. And these are Chinese that are pushing the coal cars out of that mine. That's right. Next to each one of the Chinese is a white miner. And so what they've done is they actually hired the Chinese miner at much less than their going rate. Yeah. And the Chinese, is, the Chinese miner is working for himself and for the white miner. So the white miner makes a profit on the Chinese this miner. This is what gives Dunsmuir a little time to poke about. Oh, yeah, sure. And Dunsmuir is a very, very shrewd boy. He goes on a hunting trip, um, actually northwest, about four or five miles north, northwest of Nanaimo, with a friend of his. But instead of hunting, he doesn't want He's hunting for coal. And he... He roams around the hills, and he finds a seam of coal in a place now called Wellington. And he looks at the coal. It's a good seam of coal. He thinks it's good coal. That's important. He doesn't want bituminous coal. He wants anthracite coal. But he's not dead sure. He's not that much of an expert on the types of coal, but he takes it back to a guy in Victoria who looks at it and says, yes, this is good coal. He's still not sure, but he gets a land grant in the area. And with that land grant, he develops this, this Wellington coal area. And... And it's, it's really the beginning of the fortune of Robert Dunsmuir. Not much doubt about it. He makes sure he consolidates his hold on that area. And we've, this photograph shows some of that activity. Obviously, this is quite some distance into it, sure. because look at all of the coal cars. Look at, and look at the old guy yeah. down on the dock with the beard growing and stuff. Sure. So this is around that era. Yeah, this would probably be later. This would probably be 18, early 1890s. Yeah. And, uh, but it gives you an idea. And the interesting thing, that shows a locomotive, which reminds me of a story in the early years, around the late 1860s, I guess. They brought over an, a little locomotive called the, the Pioneer from England, shipped it all the way in from England. And it wasn't very big. It was probably about 15 feet long. And the Indians were mining around Nanaimo at the time when they brought this locomotive in. And somebody mentioned that this would do the work of 100 men. Well, one of the Indian chiefs says, no, it won't. And he says, yes, it will. So the Indians got 100 warriors out there, and they tie a rope onto, the, onto this locomotive, and they, they give the signal. The Indians start pulling on the rope, and the pioneer starts pulling on the rope. He backs it up and throws Indians all over the track. They believed it. Yeah. Did the work of 100 men. They decided yeah. to stop fighting against steam oh, yeah. power. <laughs> and so what happens then, essentially, is that, is that, that Dunsmuir changes from being an ordinary coal miner although he retains some of his early contacts, and he becomes a mine owner. And there's, there's a change in the man, too. Um, as he becomes a mine owner, he becomes very paternalistic. He, uh, anything that Robert Dunsmuir says is correct, according to him, and he will follow that rule. He brook no opponents. Absolutely none at all. 
And uh, we find that, that because of the, as, as the mine started to, to penetrate deeper into the bowels of the earth, it became more dangerous, of course. And the miners wanted a little more pay. They struck for pay. And Dunsmere shows some of his colors here because uh, he then turns out some of the miners he had worked with. He evicts them from the houses that they were in because they were company houses. And um, I think that's a pattern he tends to follow for the rest of his days pretty well. It's a pretty forceful fellow. What are these guys yeah. making at this time? I, what's, a, what's a good wage for a miner? Well, the average miner works on contract. He works for about $3, $3.5 a day, sometimes $4, very good miner in a very good seam. So he, so many tons, he gets paid so much per ton, and it varied from a dollar, dollar twenty, dollar thirty, dollar forty, depending upon the times. And the, so he would get a fair amount. Uh, the average white miner in in the mine itself would get about two fifty. Um, the average Indian miner would get about a dollar fifty. And then came the Chinese; they were the lowest on the on the scale. They would get a dollar to a dollar twenty five. Now, this I've got a, an artifact here. This is a a pick. Now, what would be the job of the miner? I'm trying to get an image of what's happening underground in Nanaimo at this day. And now, this is not a big uh, item, so obviously the quarters are pretty close. Yeah. You're, you, I mean, it must be just hemming in there. It yeah. must be hot. What's happening in the mine? Well, the, the, the mines are ventilated. As the deeper they go, they have to ventilate the mines. And it varies with the mine how well ventilated they are, Mike. Yeah. But this guy is concerned about one thing. He wants to mine as much coal as he can per day. A good miner will mine, you know, make three and a half dollars a day or four dollars a day. A poor miner might not make a dollar fifty a day. So they're looking at all the advantages, how thick the seam is, how easy it is to break away the coal, and so on. Well, and they're in there about go, 10 hours a day. Do you have to go in with the pick and hammer away, or did they blast? How oh, did, yeah, how did yeah, they, they get the stuff? They blasted, too, of course. But they went in with a pick and, pick and shovel and uh, mucked it out. You can see that in the... They're, they're, they actually trolley that, 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 that coal out by hand at first and later by, by machinery. And so they're digging away. And how many sure. mines are there in operation in Nanaimo? Well, there are hundreds and hundreds of men. There are a lot of mines in operation in Nanaimo, and then later, of course, in, in Wellington, and later than that in Cumberland. And, mm -hmm. and so the whole area is shot through with coal. There's not much doubt about it at all, Mike. But, you know, the beautiful thing about it was this. There was an advantage in that anybody who came to Nanaimo, whether they had experience as a miner or not, actually made pretty good money. And this affects Nanaimo itself. No. Just must grow like crazy. Oh, sure. Nanaimo grows from a ramshackle town, and it was a ramshackle town, I think, probably in the for early 1880s. Now, this is, a, this is an artifact. This is a uh, print of a painting yeah. that's done about Nanaimo. Yeah. And it, 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 this one doesn't really do justice to the, I guess the bastion is sort of ensconced mm -hmm. way over onto one side, but that's the kind of town it was, just clapboard and, yeah. uh, and existing around the 1880s. Yeah but it grows like crazy from there. It does indeed. And it's, it's not the only, the only thing that grows like crazy. Dunsmere also grows very well. So he brings in, he actually had brought in some English, some English money, some investors. He had to have their money. A guy called Diggle, uh, Wadsworth Diggle, is the, Wadham Diggle is the, is the main investor, but a number of the other English uh, uh, officers of the Royal Navy and so on invest in the company, and it's called uh, Dunsmere Diggle and Company. And um, so it, they start expanding, start making very, very good money. And the reason they start making good money is because their coal is the best and also because Dunsmere is very shrewd. They not only order Nanaimo coal, they order Dunsmere coal from Nanaimo. So he has some competition. This has a name, an international name. Sure it has. They know about this back in England. They know yep. it in the States. This is where you come for coal. Sure. And so it starts going. Here's a great shot of uh, Nanaimo. It shows the bastion in one of the docks, an early stage of the game. Uh, it's going to grow like crazy from yeah. that particular point. Where's this uh, shot taken of all the people marching down the street? That looks like a well. That, uh, a that looks like concern. Commercial Avenue in uh, in Nanaimo, and it's one of the one of the brass bands from the area, possibly Wellington. The Hotel Royal looks like quite an operation. Uh, it says, uh, we serve to save, and these are the, uh, the fire department boys. Uh, they were wrong. That, that photo was taken in about uh, 1892, but within two years, not only the fire hall burns down, but the Royal Hotel as well, Mike. So oh, no. They may serve to save, but they didn't save. 
<laughs> this must be one of those photos they wish was, was never, ever yeah. taken. Yeah, yeah, it's a when great we, photo. When we take a look at the docks in Nanaimo, yeah. I see th this shot shows some uh, uh, yeah. beautiful stone buildings sure. being built, and the Joan and uh, the... Uh, City of Nanaimo. Or are those CP boats, or who operates yeah, those Yeah, I, I think those are local boats, actually. They look like CP boats, but I, I haven't checked that. This is probably taken just after the turn of the century, but it shows the importance of Nanaimo all the way down the line when they're mining coal. This is really quite an astonishing town. Everybody's coming in there. And a very wealthy town. Well, the Nanaimo Opera. Look at this building. Isn't this hoity-toity? Grand. Three stories, stone, and what's it say? Nanaimo Opera. So there's That's the right. opera house. That's the second opera house in Nanaimo. Really one, quite impressive. Now, this shot of Church Street in Nanaimo yeah. is one of the best shots of a city of the time. It shows the, the traffic on the street, the yeah. people on the sidewalks, the Bank of Commerce is yeah. there, the Hotel Windsor. Yeah. The, there were more hotels in Nanaimo than you could shake a stick Oh, at. dozens and dozens of hotels and saloons in Nanaimo. Yeah. And uh, some of these buildings are still standing, Mike, by the way. I've got an artifact in my hot little hand, and I suppose that people from Nanaimo would... Uh, well, I don't know. Coming, as I do from Vancouver Island, Nanaimo was an important spot for beer parlors. Yeah, no doubt about it. So that would have been well used in Nanaimo. This is a tap from, from, a, yeah. from a draft beer barrel. From a keg, right? That's right. And uh, so Nanaimo does very well, but they're not the only people who are doing well. Um, Dunsmuir does very well, too. In fact, he does so well, business is booming. He has some opposition from Seattle. He has some opposition from the VCML, which is another company in the area, and some other small, smaller and larger... VCML stands uh, for... Vancouver Coal Mining and Lands Company, actually. Yeah. And uh, they're, 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 they're big competitors to Dunsmuir, but Dunsmuir probably has better coal. And he does so well that he decides to buy his partners out. He pays Diggle $600,000. And then he lives up, Mike, to an old promise he made to his wife when he was a lowly coal miner many, many years before. He said, my dear, some, someday, some year, I'm going to build you a castle. And when he made his pile, which indeed he did, <laughs> pile. and he took over the, the control of the company, which he now calls Dunsmuir and Sons, yeah. uh, he builds, starts building a castle in Victoria, and he builds the magnificent Craig Derrick. Now this shot just says it all. Here is the most magnificent piece of structure on a uh, landscape which is all Dunsmuir's. That's right. And Craig Derrick's there to this day for anybody who wants to see this, the splendor of the place. And the lowly coal miner has ascended the, the social ladder in Victoria. She is the doyen of all the social ladies and all the families in Victoria. And he is looked up to because he is the wealthiest man in British Columbia. Not very well liked in certain quarters, especially in Nanaimo. Uh, did the Hudson's Bay Company just sort of shuffle off uh, in defeat at all of this? Uh? Yeah, the Hudson's Bay Company was doing very well anyway. And, and they realized that, best. that this was not their, their ballywick. They did not do a good job of mining coal and being... Uh, a very old company and uh, well versed in, in matters of business they decided to uh, the pull out of the coal mining business which eventually they did okay now everything did not go smoothly in Nanaimo and we're going to take a break here and come back in just a second because coal mines are disasters waiting to happen and that was certainly the case in Nanaimo we'll do that right after this break <laughs> Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts and Bill Barley talking about Nanaimo today and uh, disasters, what we're talking about here. The strikes occurred that we alluded to earlier, yep. not just because they wanted more money, but they were working in dangerous environments. Oh, sure they were. You had coal dust, you had fire damp, you had methane, you had all sorts of things you didn't want underground. And the farther underground you got, the worse it got. Yeah. Now, the miners had a chance. What they didn't, what they shouldn't have done is ever, never use an open light. They should have used, what you've got in your hand, Mike, they should have used the Davy lamp. Now, this was invented in England for the miners to use in Newcastle and various sure, places. Sure, Humphrey Davy. And it would not ignite methane gas That's and coal right. dust and stuff. That's right. Well, why didn't they use it? Because it didn't shed as much light as a candle. And they were working on contract work. So working on contract work, they'd take a chance with it, they trusted the Davy, but they used the candle. And they used it, I, I think, too, too many times. To their certain detriment. Oh, for sure, for sure. Because what happened in 1879 in the Wellington mine, this is owned by Dunsmuir, they have an explosion, kills 10 men. Right now. 
And then a few years later, 1887, a horrific explosion rocks the number one mine by the VCML. And that's, it kills 148 miners. And the, the manager of the mine was a guy called Sam Robbins. And he was always worried about an explosion in his mine. He ventilated, he did everything possible, but somebody got careless. And that 148 men were killed. Virtually everybody in Nanaimo lost a relative, Mike. Virtually everybody, a son, a father, a brother, it went right down the line. And it wasn't the end of it. In 1888, in the spring of 1888, actually in January, 77 more men are killed. And uh, That's a uh, diver's lake. Yeah, so, that's right. Now, these all happened because of ignitions of these dangerous, yeah. volatile materials Combustible in the mine. Combustible materials, yeah. And boom. And, you know, hundreds and hundreds of men are killed in Cumberland and Nanaimo and Wellington yeah. all through the years of the, of the coal. This is one of the most tragic photographs I think we can take a look at, and it shows a number of people sitting around, and you may not yeah. realize what it is, but we see them sitting at a mine head somewhere waiting for the dead to be brought up. That's, that's the May the 3rd, 1887 photograph, and that's at the number one mine. And there they are, and yeah. you see there's uh, a lot of uh, coastal native people there wearing yeah. the coastal uh, uh, hats of the native sure. people and all sorts of others yeah. waiting at the mine head. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, was, it was tragic, but, uh, and you know, but it's funny, even though, even though Dun Dunsmere and the Dunsmere family became the most, most well-known and the wealthiest family in British Columbia, she turned down a, uh, an offer of $2.6 million from an English firm for some of his coal properties. And, but she turns it over to her sons, and they were essentially wastrels. And within 50 or 60 years, that vast fortune, which should have lasted forever, virtually disappears, Mike. So Dunsmuir's uh, sons do not, do not do him proud, no. and it's the Vancouver Coal and Land Company that ends up doing most of the work at the end? Well, yeah, of course, what happens essentially, Mike, is once you run the highest year of coal production in Nanaimo was 1923. Over a million tons came out of Nanaimo. But after that, it starts to decline. They run into tougher conditions, the seams get a little smaller, and of course there isn't, there, there isn't quite the demand for coal. So it, it limps along through the 30s and into the 40s. And essentially, Nanaimo eventually diversifies into other things. It's, it's a port, so it has that advantage. It has tourism possibilities. There are vast forests nearby. So that's when Nanaimo becomes the hub city rather than the coal city. Just a, a remarkable story. And so much of that is lost now. I mean, the, that whole coal component, I mean, it died during a war, of yeah. course, right after a war, so there was nobody around saving this kind of stuff. I'm amazed the bastion's there. Well, no, I, I disagree with that, Mike, no? and I'll tell you why. Because when you look at, when you wander along Church Street or Commercial Street or some of those old back streets in, in, in Nanaimo today, a lot of those buildings are still standing. Yeah. The stone buildings are practically all intact, and some of the hotels are still standing, too. Really quite a fascinating city. I guess you're right, you know, there's all these winding little streets that are going in there and... Uh, well, actually, they're radial streets, Mike. Radial, why? Because that's the shortest distance, a straight line right to the docks to load the coal. And so those were the, those, were, that's the reason why the town's laid the out that way. The original plan, yeah. Heavens to Betsy. Nanaimo, just a remarkable town. If you haven't been there, go there. And if you just go there as part of the ferry trip to the island, stop and walk around Nanaimo, a fascinating place. Thanks for being here back next time with Gold Trails.